perspective between the two countries. I think the economic dimension of the relationship between the two countries will undoubtedly increase. A movement towards greater inter interdependence is evidenced by an export and import trade uh, growth in 1970 from $10.5 billion to uh, $51.5 in 1980. Japan continues as the second largest growing market for the United States, next to Canada, while the United States continues as Japan's largest trading partner. The steady growth in long-term capital flows should further strengthen the process of bilateral economic interdependence. This progressive interfacing of national economies is only reinforced by the mutual natural security interests of Japan and the United States in East Asia and globally. However, increasing interdependence may not preclude problems in trade relations in the 1980s. The above trend may not easily alter the basic structure of U.S.-Japanese trade in which the United States exports substantial amounts of both primary commodities and manufactured goods to Japan, while a Japanese sales are overwhelmingly of manufactured goods. As generally recognized now, a major explanation of asymmetries in U.S.-Japan trade structures can be found in the different industrial structures of both countries. Obviously, the manufacturing sector in Japan must be emphasized in a country with relative no indigenous natural resources, a little arable land, and a large population. Japan must promote those industries characterized by high value content and high labor productivity in order to obtain a foreign currency for importation of uh, natural resources and foodstuffs. It's therefore not and natural that the United States, as a major exporter of primary products, should sell such items to Japan. It seems to me what has been surprising and a growing concern to many Americans is Japan's ability to export and sell well-designed, high-quality finished goods at very competitive prices. Between 1960 and 1977, the share of machinery, such as televisions, automobiles, tape recorders, uh, as a percentage of Japan's total exports to the United States increased from 17.1% to 68%. Uh, and the share of steel increased from 14 to 16.8%. Uh, and conversely, the share of textiles fell dramatically from 26.6% to 3.6%. Uh, However, the U.S. trade structure in Japan has not qualitatively changed as much in the same period. Although the share of raw materials and fuels have decreased from 57.1 to 40.3, and food product share has increased from 7.9 to 21.8 percent. The share of manufacturers has shifted slightly from 33.1 to uh, 37.9%. Changing trends in U.S. industrial structure have also only occurred at a measured pace. Economic activity continues to shift away from the manufacturing sector into service industries and the public sector. Although manufacturing remains proportionately the largest and most conspicuous sector in the U.S. economy, uh, it has experienced uh, somewhat in efficiency in some industries with regard to labor productivity or capital investment. This similarly, U.S. agriculture has shrunk by growing much more efficiently. Lastly, the tertiary level systems of transportation or distribution kind of thing remain well developed in the United States, unlike in Japan. As implied, the trade effects generated by factors such as different trade and industrial structures have been underscored by the trend of low U.S. productivity growth rate relative to its trading patterns. There has been a growing tendency among Americans to conclude, as I said, that Japan will suffer the United States as the world's 
the world's leading industrial park. Uh, business circles in recent years have been eager to learn some secret of Japan's economic success. Although the Japanese experience could perhaps contribute somewhat to the U.S. economy, but I don't think Japan is or will ever be number one, as Professor Ogle, Harvard University, asserts. Surely, Japan has succeeded in making great progress in its economy thus far. Uh, well, many reasons have been said. Probably those are already said uh, partly true. Let's say good relationship between business and government, labor management, cooperation, kind of thing. <clears throat> but it's also true that several traditional Japanese industrial sectors will confront increasing difficulties in 1980s. These difficulties will originate from the newly industrialized countries, such as Taiwan and Korea and other neighboring countries, like Japan. <coughs> These uh, newly industrialized countries will challenge not only the mature industries of shipbuilding and textiles, but also such basic industries as steel, automobiles, and TVs in the near future. In addition, Japan experiences the growing difficulties caused by astronomical increases in energy prices in the petrochemical and aluminum industries. Uh, these industries, moreover, has been quite problem problematic because they have lost price competitiveness since the 1973 oil crisis. Such a development could conceivably lead to uh, lead Japan to play less of a competitive role vis-à-vis -vis some maturing U.S. industries. Japanese policy responses were primarily aimed at restoring the balance between supply and demand in the adjustment process of structurally declining industries. Additional impetus to a change in Japanese industrial structure should develop with an average aging of our labor force and with somewhat, somewhat widening inter-industry differentials in economic consensus. That Phil already pointed out. On the other hand, what is most needed for envisagement of the 1980s the trade relationship is a realistic assessment of the relative strengths of the U.S. economy and industry. It's very strange for the American expert to talk about Japanese, and I am not an expert on the U.S. economy, but I'm not going to talk about the U.S. economy. Of course, one strength uh, pertains to an overemphasis on the relative decline of U.S. economy performance in terms of labor productivity, corporate and public and the expenditures, savings, and real capital investment. But the impression is that preoccupation with declining U.S. relative growth rate has resulted in a somewhat imbalanced assessment of the U.S. economy. Albeit that relative growth rate declines are analytically important, the overall viability of the U.S. economy is maintained by absolute levels in the various measurement categories that far exceed comparable foreign levels. Second. With regard to Japan, trade problems arising from strong foreign competition pertain only to some uh, maturing industries. Some really can be induced by short-term measures limiting the level of foreign exports, but uh, only with an acceptably high economic cost is maintained over the long run. Thus, the most mature U.S. industries, such as textiles, have moved toward greater end product specialization. Such effort can only increase the international competitiveness. Third, some U.S. mature industries now facing competitive pressures are far from losing their long-term competitiveness. The U.S. auto industry is foremost in this category. Given its projected capital expenditures, equipped modernization program, and new car designs, and I believe the auto industry and, it, and its related industries will remain a vibrant component of the American economy. It's only a question of time. It might take some time. As a foreign observer of the American scene, 
am surprised that a fourth strength of the U.S. economy is often overlooked. That is the substantial lead the United States enjoys in several industrial sectors, which have established the United States as the major competitor in those sectors. For example, consistent, a consistently high R&D expenditure should ensure the American lead in computer technology. Uh, further advancement in this most basic of high technology industries can only benefit numerous other industries incorporating microprocessing capabilities into their production processes, products, or services. Comparative lead in aircraft, aerospace communicating should maintain their competitive strengths, I think, throughout the 1980s. <laughs> and service industries will expand farther into domestic and international markets. And final strength is American development of new industries. Even though the precise futures of such industries as genetic engineering, <laughs> biotechnology, or alternative energy cannot now be discerned, their economic potentials and spin-offs are indeed promising and significant. <clears throat> In any case, what will perhaps be a necessary condition is a return by U.S. industry to its traditional commitment to long-term project planning and risk-taking. And those strengths are inherent to the U.S. economy and should affect the type and degree of trade competition experienced in U.S.-Japanese relations. At another level, the U.S. economy may benefit from external development. For instance, my understanding is that any country in an increasingly interdependent world economy would face insurmountable obstacles if it should attempt to expect, expect to achieve a comparative advantage in all industrial sectors. This attempt or expectation assumes that industrial development of other countries would remain static or relatively dynamic. Instead, cooperative projects should be exploited as a natural economic factor containing positive opportunities for both parties. In this context, performance by individual U.S. industries could benefit from an increasing number of cooperative R&D or manufacturing projects with the point counterpart. <coughs> Uh, I think in this area, future arrangements could occur between firms engaged in semiconductors, microelectronics, or robotics in computers. <laughs> Obviously, the regenerative efforts by U.S. industry will be a major determinant of U.S.-Japanese economic relations in 1980. For our part, the Japanese can shape the relationship by policies with indirect and direct effect. And at general level, the Japanese must father the trend toward greater assumption of responsibility in, in, in international affairs. We have long experienced a kind of perceptual lack in terms of, of our economic power, impact on other economies, and our role in international national decision making. And as to specific measures, the steady increase in the rate of Japanese investment in the United States is anticipated. Further technological, technical cooperation would be available to those industries adversely affected by foreign competition. The promotion of foreign manufacturers in Japan should develop along with the new American awareness of the value of exports and competitive strengths. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of time. <coughs> True policy developments, however, would be severely uh, detrimental to U.S.-Japanese -Jap relations in 1980. That is, excessive politicization of economic issues. This would only exacerbate U.S.-Japanese trade relations, perhaps to the point of reducing mutual understanding. The dispute on trade issues, which were inevitable in process of increasing interdependence and industrial adjustment, and their linkage to other issues would only heighten differences and narrow the range of possible agreements. <laughs> Second development, of course, would be an increasing recourse to protectionist measures to alleviate the
the industrial effects of foreign competition. Surely the domestic political issues raised by foreign trade will not disappear in the 1980s. And they are especially potent for the industrialized democracies and their choice to conduct economic relations on free trade principles. Any substantial movement toward a general policy of protectionism would provide for only short-term relief at long-term economic costs, while running the extreme risk of collapsing the present world political economy by a breakdown of international norms, rules, and procedures. In conclusion, the elements of competition and cooperation will be present as U.S. Japanese economic relations develop in the 1980s. Step toward management of the relationship will require better bilateral coordination, while other steps by their nature can only be implemented unilaterally. Lastly, mutual management of the relationship be diminished, if not precluded, by excessive <coughs> politicization of trade and by a policy response and protection. Thank you very much. Mr. Nakagawa is in New York. Bill and Ellen are in Washington. Uh, I thought we were going to have some difficulty getting together on a common theme, and I thought I was going to have a real problem at the end of trying to pull together three separate speeches and try and state a common thread to it, but it seems that it's, there is a common thread here, and that is that both Phil and Melner see the Japanese economy is very, very strong, although for different reasons. Mr. Um, Nakagawa sees the American economy is very strong, and all three seem to agree that uh, there's going to be some problems in the future, but there's nothing there that can't be resolved and that uh, Japanese-American relations are a strength in both countries. Let me stop there. Throw the floor open questions from you. I'm sure you have some. Uh, let's go. Over here. Yeah. You. Um. <laughs> What kind of space? Space you mean? Space. Uh, satellites? Satellite. Way up or <laughs> space? <laughs> Satellite. <laughs> In Japan, space, I mean the physical space. <laughs> it's a very important factor. We have a very small, narrow land. But talking about uh, space, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, surely in the area of high technology, uh, we, well, let me put it this way, uh, we have a, what shall I say, a industrial vision in 1980s, which was presented by Industrial Structure Council, uh, which is an advisory organ to the Japanese uh, ministry. In that vision, in 1980s, the uh, Japanese economy should pursue the <coughs> high, which I say, high technology, but we call it uh, knowledge-intensive industry. Uh, and in, in, in that context, uh, we are, we would like to promote space industry too, but uh, as I said, space industry or aircraft in these areas are so weak in Japanese economy, and, uh, and I, I think uh, it will really long time for the Japanese to be in uh, real competition with the American uh, industries in such areas, probably, if, if we are determined to go into that. And I think it is extremely difficult task for the Japanese right now, especially the space industry. Yeah, I, 
I just wanted to be a little more optimistic about it. It seems that, the, that Japan has the infrastructure for it, and all it really has to do is to decide that it wants it. It has the robotics, it has the avionics, it has the, uh, the scale industry. So essentially what it just takes is the time and the, the, time and the determination. From what I understand, it also is in, right now is negotiating and has co-production with Boeing on several military aircraft. So I see it maybe in 10 or 15 years, which in the, in the sequence is, you know, international trade is not all that long. Well, that depends upon the definition of the space industry. I thought the satellites and the, uh, the project that requires a massive amount of money that uh, NASA has already spent. In, in that scale, I, I don't think it possible, but uh, talking about the aircraft, well, we produced the Japanese airplane, which was called YS-11, and that was a kind of failure. Uh, now we are uh, taking some participation in producing a Boeing uh, 7674, mid-range yeah, mid uh, airplane, but that we participated in that work, but uh, just the 15% work is given to the Japanese side, and we are now engaged in uh, producing probably the body side or uh, the tail. I mean, you know, it's a kind of uh, peripheral function of the airplane. So that's the, uh, the current stage of that uh, industry. Probably, yeah, well, maybe in the future. We might go into that area too, but uh, I think it will take a really long time. Yeah. You will excuse me, because I have missed many of the previous sessions as a member of the council. So I'm going to take advantage of my not having been here during the past to ask each of you one question. <laughs> For you. <laughs> How was it possible for the first special of the Japanese in the truck to be destroyed after the war? Instead of the bay falling into disarray, it came out vigorous and productive. Why could the Americans have been learned from Japan on that on that topic? That is for you. <laughs> if if I have the question, then that's my uh, problem. You want me to repeat it? <laughs> may, I, may I see if I understand the question? You're saying with the physical destruction, nevertheless, the infrastructure in the sense of the, the political dimension? No, you told no. us at the end of the war yes. that the top of the Japanese Yes. Or destroy. Leaving the oh. individual oh, oh, oh. manager okay. freedom to operate. Yes. Am I right? Okay. Did yes. I understand you correctly? Yes, you did. I got it. Yes. <laughs> yes. What I would say, uh, yes, that I am sorry, I misunderstood the court. That the top structure of the corporation, this <laughs> holding uh, a holding company a holding company is a company which exists to control other companies hold stocks and the point officers and various other control devices these top holding companies of these enormous conglomerate combines were dissolved that we did do and that then left in the case of the Mitsui Zaibatsu there were roughly every submission to MacArthur was slightly different in number but roughly let us say about 340 corporations in that combine and those 
340 corporations then stood on their own two feet. Their boards of directors became boards of directors. Prior to this action, the key subsidiaries establishing the product breadth of the combine. They went from banking to insurance to steel to uh, chemicals to shipbuilding, electrical machinery, and so on and so forth, trading companies. The key subsidiaries establishing the product breadth had to sign agreements with the top holding companies in a, not, in a society which is non-contractual. Nevertheless, there were contractual agreements signed saying that these boards, even though they were boards of directors, would not exercise the powers of boards of directors without first getting guidance from the top holding company. That is what we did achieve in that program, and it put the component corporations on their own two feet, and the increased rivalry from this occurring, I think has been one of the post-war strengths to that economy. I have a very, just to add one further thought, having been rather bloodied in the field of battle at the time this was going on, I found it almost unbelievable in 1971 to sit opposite the president of the Federation of Economic Organizations, the K. Don Rand, and have him say in his judgment the dissolution of those top holding companies had been a major factor in Japan's high growth. That was a really rather <laughs> profound experience. For you. <laughs> right here. Fire away. Yours is Chuck and Chuck. Chuck and Chuck. What would you tell this audience? What's the basic or reason or factor or factor that brought about the inequality of compensation between the male <laughs> the female receive less and the male was it based on education or what? Good question. Good question. And Eleanor uh, remarked in her uh, Early, early comment that uh, wage levels between men and women are different. Well, they're different because women produce less. <laughs> Phil is in very respectable company saying that, but uh, this comes from economists believing that everybody gets one's marginal product in wage. If one doesn't start out with that mental framework, but starts out actually looking empirically, I'm not sure that one ends there. <laughs> in their own way. <laughs> Why the Japanese, after they have lost almost everything at the end of World War II, came out from nowhere and become today the second strongest economic power in the world. Whereas those other non-European societies <laughs> who have gone older than Japan I feel living from hand to mouth. <laughs> That's the subject of about three or four books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be short and sharp. <laughs> <laughs> they lost everything except the most important thing. The will uh, to produce and the ability. Those things you couldn't take away. 
That didn't really pass. They had it. The rest of it was all just a matter of pulling the stuff together and rebuilding. Now, that's no small task. <laughs> the most important thing they had, that was the education of them. <laughs> My friend? <laughs> <laughs> you and I know, and everybody seems to know, that Japan does not have its own mineral or natural resources. It's the an island empire, an island country. What do you think? Is Japan concerned with respect to the projected destruction of the dark? The dark. If the Cold War eventually becomes hot war, what do you think Japan, uh, what would be the reaction of Japan? <laughs> well, any country is going to be in the difficulties, but uh, well, it's, it's of course, Japan is very vulnerable to, uh, I mean, getting supply of natural resources such as petroleum. 99.7% uh, of oil has to be imported from other countries, and uh, 80% of those are coming from Middle East. And as you know, Middle East is a, one of the most unstable areas. And, uh, and that Japanese economy is now standing on that way that we already knew that. So we are, we have been promoted to increase our stockpile stockpiling ability, such as uh, in, in the areas of petroleum or other uh, important metals. It's, it's growing rather rapidly, but of course it's very in, uh, in, in some, somewhat shortage for some kind of real emergency of course. And of course, uh, the best solution is not to have a disruption in any part of the world. And uh, and I think U.S. and Japan could cooperate with each other in that area too. And often we have been pointed out that Japanese defense effort has been uh, neglected for many years, and this has a long history because. Uh, after the World War II, we had uh, we had a constitution which was really uh, originally uh, introduced by the U.S. occupation forces, and in that in that constitution we have a kind of uh, peace article, and uh, we have been prohibited to have a uh, the right of fighting with foreign countries and, uh, and in that limitation we have uh, we brought up uh, so-called self-defense forces we are not calling the <laughs> armies or navies and uh, the absolute level of defense expenditures in the, uh, the Japanese GMP is point nine percent and uh, well it depends upon the calculation method uh, probably 1.2 might be the correct one but uh, in any way this level is i think eighth or seventh in the world and uh, well it's not so small number but uh, because of the uh, instability of the world and uh, because of the threat of foreign powers over the Japanese, and uh, we are now gradually uh, going into increase our effort in that area too. The hour grows late. Some of you want to get a panelist one one on one. Let me turn the meeting over.
Well, on behalf of the members and our guests, we certainly do express our, our deep appreciation of the time that you've so graciously given to us and the information that you've shared for us. Thank you very much.